How could the death of the Queen affect the boundaries between English communities around the world? How could the death of the Queen affect the boundaries between English-speaking communities around the world? Well, I suppose it could go one of two ways. You know, one is that, and this would be a terrible thing, it's such, it's such bad timing in some sense, you know, I think, for, for what happened today to have happened. Um, I'm a great admirer of the, of the constitutional monarchy system. I think there's a wisdom about it, especially the way that your country has managed it, which is more, it's worked better than how any other country's managed it, maybe ever. That's really something. You know, there are obviously monarchical systems, constitutional monarchies still left in Europe, but they're kind of a pale reflection of what you've got in the UK. And uh, when Tammy and I were in Kentucky a couple of months ago, we, we were invited there by the former ambassador from the US to Canada, and she was, and her husband were fundraisers for Donald Trump. Um, and he, he, he runs a coal mine, so you can imagine why he's Republican. And, uh, and so we were, at, we were at the Kentucky Derby, which is quite the show. The Americans, they're very theatrical, man. They can put on a show like no one else. And the Kentucky Derby is definitely a show. People wear the most preposterous outfits, you know, these wild lime green suits and these amazing sort of Victorian costumes for the for the women. And they're all dressed up. There's like 160,000 people at the racetrack, and it's quite the spectacle. And we were up above the racetrack, about three floors in this glassed-in cafe. And uh, the second day we were there, Trump was going to come to the cafe, to the restaurant. And uh, I had flown out that morning to give a commencement address at this conservative college in northern Michigan. And then I flew back. And uh, just after I got there, they closed the airport. So I just got in. They closed the airports because the president is coming to town. The former president, but they still call him the president. And so really the whole city in some real sense was locked down. And then I got to the... Derby, back to the Derby, and just in time, because they're going to lock down the whole Derby. So that meant no one, 160,000 people, no one gets in or out. And then the army came in, and there was like 300 guys in camouflage, quite armed, and they were taking up their stations. And this is like three hours before Trump showed up. And then the Secret Service came in, and by that time, I had made it upstairs to the restaurant where Tammy was, and she'd been there uh, waiting, and everyone was buzzing away about the fact that Trump was coming. And the atmosphere was electric, you know, and I thought, sitting there, I thought, this must have been what it was like to be, well, around the Kennedys, say, in the 1960s, that level of fame. I've been around famous people a lot now, and there are definitely tiers of fame, you know. There's, there's not famous, and that's normal. And then there's celebrities that are maybe known locally and nationally, and then there are celebrities that are known internationally, and then there are celebrities like the Queen, who everyone, everywhere in the world knows, who, among famous people, they're hyper-famous. And Trump is in that category. And he's a very strange person in that category, I would say, because he's not just famous for being president, which is already something that makes you pretty damn famous, but he was really famous as a as a businessman before that, and as a nouveau riche sort of businessman, and as a kind of brash entrepreneur and a character, and he was very famous for that. But then he got even more famous as a TV celebrity for like 15 years, and that's actually really hard, you know, regardless of what you think about it ethically, or, you know, whether you think the kind of entertainment that he did, um, that he involved himself in was worthwhile. I don't care about that. that. That's not my point. My point is that managing that successfully for 15 years is exceptionally unlikely and difficult. And he was extremely famous as a consequence. And that was sort of laden on top of his fame for on the business front. And then he became president. And so that's a lot of fame, man. And when, when that much fame surrounds you, your life is very weird. And the probability that people are going to respond to you in a normal, in the normal way that helps keep you sane is very low. Especially maybe if you're also an intimidating 
person to begin with, with a bit of a proclivity, let's say, towards disagreeableness. Because maybe then you chase away the people who would have enough sense to tell you when you go a little bit too far. Anyways, we were up there in the restaurant, and the place was just buzzing, and then Trump came in, and it was you could just feel the energy, the electric energy, and I thought, this is not good. This is too much, man. This is too much for anybody to bear. And the thing about the monarchy that's so cool, you know, in the United States, there's the judiciary and the legislative branch and the executive, that separation of powers, and the checks and balances that are part and parcel of that, and that's a bright system. And then you also have the states, and they have their power against the federal government, and that stops anything from becoming too tyrannical in principle. But here, and in Canada, although less so in Canada, because we're, you know, modern and trying to dispense with the monarchy, modern, confused, dim-witted, and untraditional, <laughs> um, and casual and careless, and then we have the French-English problem, which makes things more complicated on the monarchical front, you have four divisions. You have executive, legislative, um, judicial, and symbolic. And the monarch holds the symbolic weight. And that's really smart because it separates it to some degree from the political weight. You know, you see what happens in the United States is, well, first of all, is the president tends to turn into this, to the czar. You know, because they have this idea in the United States now, like first lady. It's like, what the hell is that? We don't have that in Canada. Nobody knows anything about, about Justin Trudeau's wife. And that's been the history of, of Canadian politicians. It's like, just because you're Justin Trudeau's wife doesn't mean you're queen. But in the United States, it's like, well, you know, Hillary Clinton, maybe she's queen. And that's, and that's partly because there is that demand for the symbolic weight that the leader should manifest. And you also see that to some degree in the United States, which is a star-worshipping culture, obviously, with the glitterati and the royalty of Hollywood. And it's better put there. It's better put there in the entertainment section, even though that's also somewhat dangerous because it tends to elevate actors into pronouncements of ethical vir pronouncers of ethical virtues, say. But better there than in the political realm. Trump, he's like king and president all rolled up into one. And that's just too much. And so... And so I really admire the monarchical system, and I think that for whatever reason, the UK has done a wonderful job of maintaining that. And I think a very economically canny job, too, because I know the economic analysis indicate that the royal family generates way more income than they spend. You know, because they're a major, and everything they're associated with here is a major tourist attraction. It's this tradition that you have here, this monarchical tradition, is something that's tremendously attractive to people who don't have that, Canadians, for example, Americans. Because it's, it's just, it's so theatrical and so unique.